when we talk about Marx, and I think it was made very clear by Professor Bhattacharya in the first session, we always think of Marx in terms of his activism. So that way, uh, Professor Bhattacharya addressed a somewhat, in a somewhat unconventional manner, the issue of philosophy. And one problem of Marx, I think, was that he did not specifically, in, in fact, Althusser, in his later writings, in one of his later writings, he made such an allegation against Marx that uh, the problem with him, and that is the problem for the future generation of Marx, who is interested in Marx, that he did not write any specific treatise on philosophy. So <laughs> that is the problem. You, you have to actually find out uh, philosophical elements in Marx's writings. So that way, aesthetics is another area where you get traces of elements of aesthetics in, in Marx. But he, Marx, did not leave behind any work on aesthetics, any book, any treatise on aesthetics. Say, for instance, in the case of Kant or in the case of Hegel, you can identify very specifically the philosophical texts. But in the case of Marx, you don't get it. So you, you have to find out. You have to interpret. You have to read. So uh, that's why, actually, we uh, invited these two very eminent speakers to look at Marx in a somewhat unconventional manner. So, uh, Professor Shomik Bandhapadhyay, he will speak on uh, Marx's aesthetics. So, we start at, say, 4.50. It will continue, say, up to 6.20. So, that one hour, 30 minutes. And uh, he will speak for about, say, one hour, one hour, five minutes or 10 minutes is <coughs> left to him and then question answer session and we close at about 6.20. Please, Professor Gondavatta. Shobhanar has already said that one of the problems when talking about Marx and aesthetics is that Marx did not produce any specific text on aesthetics as such. <laughs> and even the term aesthetics very rarely appears in Marx. Very rarely and never in focus, even when it comes. So what I'll be really talking on is uh, what I would call the politics of aesthetics. Because that is a focus that Marx was exploring, in a way, in his writings. Now, what has generally happened is that we go back to that text or a number of texts where he talks about the base and the superstructure and the emphasis on the economic structure of a particular phase of social development and how that is the base and then the superstructure, he doesn't talk directly about even literature. It's mostly legal, philosophical, etc., etc., etc. So some of these very basic texts have <laughs> circulated, and I'll go back to these texts. The first text is the preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy, written in London in January 1859. And almost simultaneously published in German in Berlin the same year. Now, right at the beginning, he warns the reader who on the whole desires to follow me must be resolved to ascend from the particular to the general. And 
when he talks of the particular and the general, the particular is not necessarily the empirical, but of course the empirical is very much part of the particular. Rather than any master theory, which is used as a framework or as a point of departure to study experiences or phenomenon. That is a warning that resounds right at the beginning. So I'll also come back at one point to the particular and try to build out of the particular to the general on Marx's lines and use two or three instances. But before that, if you look at that first sentence of that text, social being and social consciousness, in the social production of their life, men enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of the will, relations of production which correspond to a definite stage of development of the material productive forces. But if you look closely at the very first phrase, it is not in the social production as such, not in the sense of what society produces, the phrases in the social production of their life. So how the men produce themselves socially. It is their own social incorporation, their social engagement with life, their socialization. It is in the social production of the life, the way they produce their life. And immediately, it is an active and participatory process of incorporating oneself in social existence. It is not what is produced in life or in society, which in its turn is an intricate network of what he calls definite relations, indispensable and independent of the will, relations or production. So one has to enter this network, means positioning oneself in the phenomenon of production, in what he calls a definite stage of development of the material productive forces. So right from the beginning, it is the social production of life the individual taking part in it, not just taking part in it, becoming part of it, being incorporated, becoming part of the body of that social production, becoming part of that process. That complexity is brought in right there. The sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which rises a legal and political superstructure and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. He is not talking anywhere of literature, arts, culture as such. These terms don't come in here. It is a legal and political superstructure to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The focus is on social consciousness and social consciousness related to the social production of the life. So in the social production of their life, as you enter that process, you find a consciousness because you have to deal with it in a participatory, organically participatory manner. Even as Marx connects or relates the change of the economic foundation with the transformation of the entire immense superstructure, the social, political, and intellectual life process in general, he brings in, if you look at the text closely, a cautionary rider, a distinction, the word is distinction, a distinction should always be made between the material transformation of the economic conditions of production, which can be determined 
with the precision of natural science. This is one entity and distinguishing from the legal, political, religious, here the word aesthetic comes in, aesthetic or philosophic. In short, ideological forms in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. So one of those strange superstitions that have always adhered to Marx is that Marx gave a formula that whatever is happening in the economic sphere and the economic transformation immediately influences or determines, the word determine never comes here. And the very clear, even in that master text, the distinction between the material transformation of the economic conditions and the legal, political, religious, aesthetic, or philosophic, in short, ideological forms in which men become conscious of this conflict and fight it out. So that consciousness arises from this fighting with the transformation, with the process. And through that, a consciousness grows, happens, evolves. There is no fixity or no fixture of the consciousness. You can't really identify. So even that whole question of marking a certain writer as belonging to a class, an economic class, and therefore in this economic transformation, if that class loses its power, then he automatically goes to one side, or if it gains power, he goes to the other side. That kind of mechanistic determinism, Marx is cautioning us against right from the beginning, even from that text. The next text is from the German ideology, uh, <clears throat> where again, consciousness can never be anything else than conscious being. Now, incidentally, uh, Schrodinger made a very important point about the language, the German language and the English language. At the same time, after all, uh, English comes from its Germanic roots. The strongest element in English is its Germanic origins, is Saxonic origins. And therefore, if you follow the English closely, it is a very close translation of the German. So conscious being is not the noun being, but the active uh, verbal noun, being. So consciousness is not anything fixed, but conscious being. You go on being with the transformative process, and you're part of it. You're, you, you, you are a component of that process also. And the being of man is the actual life process. That being, you have to take part in the political, in the economic and political process. You can't stay away from it. There's no way. Whether you want it or not, whether you like it or not, you get into the process if you are taking part in an actual life process. In direct contrast to German philosophy, which descends from heaven to earth, here it is a matter of ascending from earth to heaven. So if you are in this process of being, so whatever philosophy, whatever aesthetics, whatever superstructure, this will emerge from your process of being. Not of setting out from what men say, imagine, conceive, nor from men as narrated, thought of, imagined, conceived, in order to arrive at men in the flesh, but of setting out from real, active men, 
and on the basis of the real life process, demonstrating the development of the ideological reflexes. The word is again very carefully chosen. It's a reflex. It's not a reproduction. You, you hit something and there is a reaction. That's it. It's a reflex, a flex, not something determined, clearly done or clearly registered or stamped, nothing of the kind. The word very carefully chosen is reflex. It hits and sparks off. Reflex and echoes of this life process. Very carefully chosen words, reflex, echoes. Never the word influence, nothing deterministic, nothing controlling in this process which is empirically, nothing which is empirically verifiable and bound to material processes. The phantoms formed in the brains of men are also necessarily sublimates of the material life process. And when we talk of aesthetics, when we talk of the cultural products, when we talk of the literary products, in this whole process, these are basically those phantoms formed in the brain, which are necessarily sublimates, not translations, not immediate products, but sublimates of this encounter. It's this encounter that gets sublimated into the cultural products, into the creative products. When Marx says, quote, it is not consciousness that determines life, but life that determines consciousness, unquote, he opens up an aesthetics in the close penetrating study of this creative dialectic. So he shows us the way, opens out that possibility of a new aesthetics where we study the situation, the actual choice positioning of the creative writer or the creative artist, the creative producer, I would say, in the process. And so that the individual sensibility is subsumed in what he calls the real living individuals themselves consciousness considered solely as their consciousness. The, con the consciousness of a whole class of people in this process, but the individual creator sublimates out of that, out of that larger experience. So immediately, in terms of creativity, in terms of cultural production, <coughs> something very significant comes into play. It's no longer an individual artist or a creator in his uh, glow of light, as English Romantic poets would conceive the artist, in an exclusive glow of light, which shuts the artist away from everything around this magic illuminated space where all the illumination is his or her personal, individual illumination, and the cultural product comes out of that. Which was the romantic reading of creativity, the, cult, the creative moment. This Marx is challenging and critiquing, where he says that it becomes a much more complex thing. Can, a, un, un, unless it is a very, very special neurotic condition, which can of course happen in certain cases, but it is a neurosis, where somebody is totally cut off from everything around himself, and he can create something out of that, of course. But these are the exceptionals. These are the neurotics. But otherwise, a creative artist works in a community and 
even when you come to the core of it, an artist, whether working with words, or working with his own body, or working with lines and colors, or working with his tones, or sounds, whatever he's working with, he's working with a language. A language which a community has produced over the years. And to express himself, he needs that language. And when he takes up that language, along with the language, inherent in the language, he relates to the community. The community in a process. And the community, again, is changing the language. The community doesn't give you a rediment language as a fixity, as a constant, as a permanent. So any creative artist is working, however individualistic he may be. The moment he chooses a language, he is choosing a community. He's connecting himself, integrating himself, incorporating himself in the community. And how can he remain unaffected by the community entirely, however individualistic he may be? So that is where Marx's emphasis is the real living individual themselves, consciousness considered solely as their consciousness, the consciousness of a community, which is your medium, which is your language. So this entire complexity, which was not available to aesthetic criticism, to literary criticism for a long time, to artistic criticism, where at a point of time, the point of time when Marx emerges, there has been the great period of German Romanticism, which had carried on to England, to the Anglo-American world. And Romanticism had emphasized the point of the exclusivity of the individual creator. And all the reading of literature, the reading of the arts, had got bogged down in this individual voice, the exclusive voice. Marx introduces a different complexity into the whole aesthetics of creativity. The moment he brings in the community, the process, and the individual incorporated in it, the individual not looking at it from the distance, the moment it touches language, he touches the raw flesh and blood of a community in its history, in its process of change. Marx says its premises are men, not in any form of isolation and fixity, but in their actual empirically perceptible process of development under definite conditions. Incidentally, uh, when Marx was working on these ideas, Engels was working with him as a very close, I would say, at that stage at least, after Marx's death, it became a different role for Engels, is that Marx was working more as a kind of a research assistant. Engels was working more as a research assistant to Marx, gathering the material, reading up a lot of stuff, summarizing them, choosing things for Marx to read. This was the role that Engels was playing. And if you read Engels's Condition of the Working Class in England, which was one of these basic documentations that Engels provided Marx with at that point of time, he falls back again and again, Engels in this <coughs> work on Dickens. And a very different way of reading the times that came in, and somewhere I have the feeling that even as Marx was thinking on these lines of a different aesthetics, there was the example of Dickens working behind it. Dickens was a witness to the first impact, the brutal 
physical, visible, immediate impact of the Industrial Revolution. The plague, people dying on the streets, massive migrations from the villages who don't have a place in the city, who live on the streets and in the slums, starvation deaths, diseases, visible. At a point of time when the newspapers proclaim high productivity, great expansion of the empire, these are the roaring headlines of the newspapers. And Dickens comes out on the streets and sees the criminal underworld, poverty, hunger in the raw. But what happens when Dickens comes to write? And Dickens is a popular writer. More than that, students of literature, if there are some here, would know that to make a living, a hard living, books didn't sell that much. And Dickens needed money. He gave public readings of his novels, portions he would read in public. And he would ask, and, and, and there would be tickets sold from which he made his money and made his living. So he was directly addressing the Victorian readers, the London readers, even went to small towns, quite extensively went to the small towns. So his reach to the reader was phenomenal. And the first popular public writer of the time was Dickens. Dickens was writing about this whole experience, but how was he writing about it? In novel after novel, Dickens creates the situation, and I fall back on Marx's word, sublimation, sublimates this experience. How? In novel after novel, you find a child, a poor child, an abandoned child, an orphan thrown out of his house, the child as the victim, the victim of this elaborate process of industrialization. The abandoned child and a child threatened, pursued by a character who is monstrous. Monstrous in terms of the fairy tales and folk tales of the period, an ogre. Even the names, there's an allegory, a strange modern urban allegory at work. David comes to stay with his stepfather. The name is Mr. Murd Stone, Murder and Stone. The place where he goes to stay, the name of the place is Blunderstone. His wife, his, his mother has married this man. It's a stony blunder, blunderstone. And when Miss Murdstone comes, his father's, his new father's sister, whenever she comes in, there is a jangle of chains and locks and keys. And Mr. Murdstone is a businessman. Money, the jangle of coins, the name Murdstone, monstrosity, monstrosity in its real thing, inhumanity, something that's not human. Allegorized in Oliver Twist, the name is Fagin. Scrooge. Look at the names. In hard times, the name of this industrialist, man of power, man of money is Grad Grind. In an early draft in the manuscript, we find the name Grab Grind, one who grabs and grinds. He chained the B to the D to make it harder and harsher. Grad Grind. So, and these are the monsters. So it's a modern fairy tale, which is a sublimation of the new industrial 
exploitation, where the poor are really chewed up, destroyed, mauled by industry and thrown out on the streets. Dickens becomes one of the sources of study. Dickens becomes a document also for both Engels and Marx at this point of time. So I, I, I sometimes even suspect that, that that whole idea of the sublimation of the actual relations of production and its mechanisms may have come very directly from Charles Dickens. Because that's what Engels and Marx were studying at that point of time. But what happened soon after Marx's death was that this whole reading of how reality turns into literature, how reality is translated or recreated in cultural terms becomes a cultural product. This is misread and distorted, driving poor Engels to write his famous letter, and not just one letter, series of letters, in fact. The first is to Joseph Bloch, 21st to 22nd September, 1890. According to the materialist conception of history, the ultimately and he underlines the word ultimately. Ultimately determining factor in history is the production and reproduction of real life. Neither Marx nor I have asserted more than this. Hence, if somebody twists this into saying that the economic factor is the only, and he underlines only, only determining one he transforms that proposition into a meaningless, abstract, absurd phrase. The economic situation is the basis, but the various elements of the superstructure, the political forms of the class struggle and its results, such as constitutions established by the victorious class after a successful battle, etc., juridical forms, and especially the reflections of all these real struggles in the brains of the participants, political, legal, philosophical theories, religious views, and the further development into systems of dogmas also exercise their influence upon the course of the historical struggles, and in many cases, determine their form in particular. There is an interaction of all these elements. In yet another letter, a letter to Mehring, dated 18, 14 July 1893, in the first instance we all laid and were bound to lay the main emphasis on the derivation, and the underlines the word derivation, the derivation of political, juridical, and other ideological notions from basic economic facts. But at the same time, we have, on account of the content, neglected the formal side. This has given our adversaries a welcome opportunity for misunderstandings and distortions. It is the old story. Form is always neglected at first for content. And then we become aware of the form. The fatuous notion of the ideologists that because we deny an independent historical development to the various ideological spheres which play a part in history, we also deny them any effect upon history. That's a fatuous notion. The basis of this is the common undialectical conception of cause and effect as rigidly opposite poles, the total disregard of interaction. What Marx is trying to do, and Engels is trying to 
explain even further after his death, when Marx is no longer there to explain it any longer, is that an intricate interaction between all these forces, with the economic base only as the base, but upon this, all these things, and he even goes to the point of saying that the economic base is affected by the ideas, by the generation of ideas, even by the cultural products that ultimately flow from the ideas, even they come to affect the economic base and the basic political structure at various points in various ways. It is the process of this interaction which becomes his focus. The other idea, so this is one idea, and the other idea, and I'll just work on these two ideas and go to some instances. In the German ideology, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. That is the class, which is the ruling material force of society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. And how it happens, that also Marx explains, to its control of the means of mental production. And there are so many instances, probably the simplest and most familiar immediate instance that I could cite would be the case of the colonial education system in India. The new ruling class, once it comes in place, the first thing they do in 1857, simultaneously, the three universities in India come into being, Calcutta, Bombay, and Madras. And very interestingly, once again, for those of you who are students of education would know that affiliating universities were rare in the world at that point of time. Very rare one or two instances. Universities were residential universities, centers where people went and studied. But all these three universities were affiliating universities. For years, for 20 years, 30 years, in all these cases, the universities did not teach. The universities were controlling units for the entire education system. From the primary to the middle to the secondary to the master's course, the entire education system, like a pyramid, was controlled by the university at the apex point. So the entire meant the means of mental production, the use of language, the use of words, the use of knowledge. All this, the ruling class immediately controls because, and right at that point of time, long before the administrative system, the daily political handling of the situation had come under their control, the universities were in place. That is controlling the mental production. The ruling ideas are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relations. The dominant material relations grasped as ideas. Ideas explain and justify and rationalize the dominant material relations. That is how the ideas are constructed, manufactured, mobilized in the teaching institutions. Hence of the relations which make the one class the ruling one, therefore the ideas of its dominance. They rule also as thinkers, as producers of ideas, and regulate the production and distribution of the ideas of their age. Thus, their ideas are the ruling ideas of the epoch. Now, these are the two major elements that have contributed to efforts to create a Marxian aesthetics. The first part and the second part, 
how the ideas of the ruling class are created, circulated, and create a kind of mental structure, a control over the pattern of thinking, the nature of thinking of a community. And automatically, something else which Marx goes on suggesting, part of his larger philosophical discourse, the discourse of resistance, the discourse of transformation. So once the ideas of the ruling class, they come to dominate and they create this massive system of power, there has to be a resistance generating against it. And that has to operate. Going back to the first thing, people in their lives, in their living, they create their language, their culture, the culture of resistance. And a different sensibility comes into play, which leads on at one point to a revolutionary sensibility. The initial resistance organizing, mobilizing to its revolutionary potential at the end of it. So this is the broad framework that emerges out of this woefully inadequate body of statements, suggestions that Marx has left for a new Marxian aesthetics. I'll try to use some instances of how these ideas have operated and how these, have, these ideas have helped us to read certain major aesthetic moments, aesthetic experiences, and cultural productivity. One of the first instances, or rather the first instance that I'd like to cite, is a case of our readings of Greek tragedy, which has been such a major factor, not only in our reading of life and culture, different forms of literature, not necessarily drama, but even fiction. When we talk of the novel, we talk of the plot. We talk of how the plot is constructed. We judge novels on the quality of the plot on whether the plot has a beginning, a middle, and an end, all in place. We talk of the power of a work of literature in terms of its tragic potential, of its tragic strength. All these come from Aristotle. Now, incidentally, if you just go by the dates, and even my teachers in college never pointed it out to me, but I discovered it quite easily. If you go by the dates, neither Plato nor Aristotle had ever seen any of the great Greek plays in performance. The dates just don't match. There is a gap of more than a century. Iscalus's dates, circa 525 to circa 456 BC, Sophocles, circa 496 to 406 BC, Euripides, circa 480 to 406 BC, Plato, circa 428 to 347 BC, Aristotle even later, 384 to 322 BC. Incidentally, Aristotle was the private tutor of Alexander the Great, whose dates are 356 to 323 BC. Now, you see the politics of aesthetics, the term that I used right at the beginning in play here, where Plato objects to the Greek tragedies on the ground that these tragedies and all these three playwrights, they create, they throw up, they elevate two emotions. And these are absolutely vicious emotions. One is pity and the other is terror or fear. 
Now, use your common sense. If you're talking of emotions which are evil, which are vicious, you single out just two emotions, pity and fear. Are these really so horrible? What about lust? What about greed? What about the sadistic desires? But none of these are mentioned. The only two emotions, the worst possible emotions for Plato, are pity and fear. And because the tragedies, they throw up pity and fear, they sh therefore they should not be allowed in the ideal commonwealth. Simple common sense would tell us that pity and fear are the worst possible emotions in a military state, in a state of war. All other emotions, all the filthiest, horrible, vicious emotions are perfectly okay in wartime. We can ask our soldiers, we do, we do ask our soldiers to rape the women on the other side. We tempt our soldiers to loot and plunder the other side. All these are perfectly legitimate when you're thinking in terms of war. And Greece is thinking in terms of war. This is the period of Alexander the Great out on his conquests. And Aristotle, poor Aristotle, who loves his master Plato, admires Plato, has a weakness for the tragedy. So he creates a case for the tragedy, arguing laboriously and pointlessly that these tragedies, they raise the pity and fear of human beings to a pitch, to a point where the bodily system cannot take it any longer and the bodily system purges it. So there is a catharsis, there is a purgation. So it has a purgative function and therefore let's allow it. After all, it expels pity and fear from the viewers. And therefore, it's good for our purposes. Now, somehow, people, these people, neither Plato nor Aristotle had seen the plays. In the experience of the Greek tragedies, whatever little evidence we still have, there are uh, statements stray statements left by people who had seen these plays in those days, there was no purgation of pity and fear at the end. People were haunted by the pity and the fear and the terror of it all. Of course they were. So all this was a construction, a very deliberate construction. And when this construction, and this becomes an aesthetic value, that pity and fear and the purgation of these emotions this is considered to be an ideal, an aesthetic ideal, and only then you reach the Shuddha Bhava. There have been critics who have then matched it with the Gita, where the yogi is one who is Dukkeshu Anudvigna Mana Sukeshu Vigatas Preha. So it's almost that. So you create a whole aesthetics out of this. Why should it be the end of an artistic product or a cultural product to leave the viewer completely emotionless, drained of his emotions? Why? We want to come back to life with our emotions intact or fighting with our emotions ourselves. We don't want to be clinically cleansed of our own emotions the emotions that we have cherished and shared and lived through. And this entire politics of aesthetics was transmitted to us in the Victorian period as part of our knowledge package. For years, the history of this who were the people who wrote these plays? Where were they played? How were they played? When? These are just written off. 
And it is only now where you don't need any great scholarship. Use your common sense and read your history. And this we can do, thanks to Marx, who taught us to historicize, to locate, to situate the works, the, the, the creative products, and read the meanings. This is one case. Let's take a more contemporary case. This is a point a few minutes ago, Schrodinger and I, we were discussing there. We are living in a time where the dominant economic system is capitalism. I'm not passing judgment on capitalism or anything. It, it's a fact. It's a reality. And the ruling class is a ruling class that upholds capitalism, that swears by capitalism. No secrets, nothing about that. And what happens, and, and, and what is the new aesthetics that comes out of this? And how the ruling class creates its ideas? And how, how is it created? Again, again, the question of the mechanism, the construction of the mental production how mental production is controlled. In Calcutta, at least, at one point of time, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even into the 80s, at least for the urban, enlightened middle class, and the other classes that were moving towards this middle-class urbanity, the major cultural form that drew people and that created an area of discourse was the theater. And the theater set up its own aesthetics, an aesthetics in which realism was at the center. Realism was the point of reference. Think in terms of the economics. It's a state which hasn't completely identified with capitalism as yet. It still had a socialist agenda. And there were contradictions in the process. But still, the agenda was socialist. The ruling class was upholding a certain kind of socialist project. And a socialist project needs a kind of understanding of the needs and the deprivations of a society. A sharing in this knowledge, only if this knowledge is shared, only if this knowledge is realized, the society the more privileged would also accept the claim of the underprivileged. There was this need for an egalitarian, liberal humanism. But this was the program of the ruling class at that particular point of time. It was part of the agenda of the ruling class. So theater in Calcutta was a realistic theater. It studied the social reality at different levels, human relationships within those parameters, even the cinema, the new cinema which emerged in 1955. And date-wise, if you can think of the politics, 52 we had our first elections. The first parliament was in place. And in 54, we have a production like Bohrupi's Rakta Karabi, which was history. And in 55, we have Shratujit Raya's Patermachali. Very significantly at that time. We can't think of a Rakta Karabi now. We can't think of a, a Patermachali any longer. It would be completely an anachronistic thing right now. 
So it was the politics of the time that led these things, that determined these things in a manner, into which obviously the creative individuals were playing their part, and these particular forms were being identified, being nurtured, being created. The forms were evolving within this political vortex. And that created their audiences, where the older theater, the theater of the commercial theater in Shambazar, died a natural death, because that had become anachronistic. The social relationships, the kind of emotions and sentiments that were being churned out there had become unreal. So it died a natural death. There was no other reason. They had wonderful actors, great actors, who could make you weep or laugh at the will. Of course, they were there. But somehow, it lost its relevance. It lost its meaning politically. And over the years, as the capitalist agenda took over, that theater, the whole rich cinema that began with Shruti Rai in 1955, and that carried on in the South, masterworks by the filmmakers in Kerala, filmmakers in Gujarat, in Manipur, all over the country, completely died out. Because a different political agenda, the ruling class sets out a different program, a different agenda. So what culture now needs is creating more consumers. If we have to produce more, we need more buyers. Let's have more buyers. And if the buyers start thinking in egalitarian terms, in terms of sharing, how are they going to buy? They would try to divide up the money, share the money with others. They won't have enough money to buy. So concentrate on the buyers, turn theater into a spectacle, turn cinema into a spectacle. <coughs> so whether we want it or not, it's still the economic forces, the market forces, and the way the market forces are being controlled, tempered, handled, manipulated by the state. And this wonderful triadic system, the media, the media is supported and sustained by capital. Newspapers don't survive on the sales. They survive on advertisements. And the state is interested in furthering its capitalist agenda. Therefore, the state would support capital, and capital would support media. So the three together, they mobilize, manipulate, and control the mental production. So theater, cinema, the very possibility, at one point, uh, even in the visual arts, the very possibility of a public art. And incidentally, when Tagore, post First World War, and coming closer and closer to the Second World War, becoming more and more conscious of capitalism, talking directly about capitalism, he creates Shantiniketan as a space for public art. Art on the walls, outside, sculptures and murals. And the wonderful history, once again, entirely coming in from politics. There was this, this discussion between Tagore and Gandhi in Shantaniketan, where Nandalal Bose was also present, where Tagore was complaining, which he had complained in his writings also again and again, 
that the entire nationalist politics of the Congress at that particular point of time had been turned into a politics of talking to the masters, the colonial masters across the table, negotiating for some more advantages, some more rights here and there. And the movement had got cut off from the people, from the people's demands, their issues, the local. The local had got lost in this massive so-called national agenda. This was a complaint that Tagore was making again and again. And this complaint he made to Gandhi in Shantaniketan. And then this idea came up between Tagore and Gandhi. And Nandalal was brought into it. The idea that when these Congress leaders met at their annual Jambori, the National Congress, if this entire space could be culturally redefined and recast with murals all over, showing the people of India in the different parts of India, their dresses, their living, their huts, their places, their objects, and their bodies, physical bodies, larger than life bodies, painted all over. Then when the Congress leaders confabulated among themselves, they looked around and there was the presence, the physical, visual, cultural presence of the people. And this would somewhere shake them up, conscientize them to a certain extent, and something may happen out of that. And Nandalal did the murals for the Haripura Congress. So creating a cultural space which would cast its presence, its physical, visible presence, its sensual presence on the politics. And this possibility was further developed after that in Shantaniketan. When Tagore sets up the Hindi Bhavan, he asks Binod Bihari Mukherjee to paint over the walls the sub-religious sects and their prophets, the saints, the saint poets. So a mural that covers mapping the whole of India in terms of the non-institutional bhakti singers from all over the country, from every part of the country. Giving the Shantaniketan place a larger political cultural space a historical space. When Ram King Kurt paints the Shantals in their daily mode of life outside, later on, when this, all these painters and sculptors, Shomna Thor, Keja Subramanian, all of them do the murals, where people can just walk in and watch them. In India, this is the largest public art gallery at the moment, with so many major artists on permanent display. At a time when you see art becoming completely commodified, every day the only mention of art comes to you through the media when there is a 20 lakh or a 30 lakh or two crores sale of a certain painting. That becomes news. Nothing else matters. So the arts go out of our experience, the public experience. It gets into a space of the market. The way writers are promoted, Yesterday, we were having a seminar, a panel discussion, where the social scientists, Partha Chatterjee, Pradeep Bosch, two writers, Anita Agnihotri and Shapna Moy, and I was conducting it. We were lamenting the fact that Bengali books are not reviewed any longer in the newspapers. Even the Bengali newspapers review only half of them, at least, books in English. <coughs> 
you have this massive marketing of the literary fests, lit fests, where the only writers projected are writers who write in English, and only marginally sometimes, because you have to keep to the rules and keep a show, they are just put in here and there. So a very deliberate marginalization of the language cultures, marginalization of the local, that Tagore, through the Haripura paintings of Nandalal, wanted to bring into the center. <laughs> All this is being manipulated to ensure that in the economic system, there would be one single class of consumers. Even the loss of language, when you write only SMSs, when you go in only for the email messages, you are losing your control of the language. When you, go, when you don't read, when you go to the Wikipedia, you get information, you don't get ideas. The entire circulation of ideas, the dissemination of ideas, the clash and conflict of ideas, this is being smoothened out. Even in the examination system, the kind of objective type questions, which is a question of memorizing bits and pieces of fragmented information. So this entire control of mental production, which is sinister, and this way of looking at culture, not as independent works of art, a novel, a book of poems by a poet, but looking into this whole experience as a civilizational question. That is the politics of aesthetics that Marx gave us, even in his fragmented writings and observations. Thank you. German romanticism, jeta pori English, ite alu romanticism. Amar actor prosno je romanticism ke hai to shei orthe Marx prosre dhani, thiki. Kintu romanticism er bhitore joru nee jo subjectivity, consciousness er ije ekta bappar achi. Ani sheeta shonge Marx se negotiation thiti kiro gomchi. একটা জিনিস বোধহয় বলা দরকার যে আমরা যখন রোম্যান্টিসিজমের কথা বলি আর একটা কথা বলা যাক যে রোম্যান্টিক রোম্যান্টিসিজম এই কথা দুটো ইংরেজিতে একরকম মানে বাংলাতে কিন্তু সম্পূর্ণ অন্য মানে মানে বাংলাতে কোনো কিছু একটু সেন্টিমেন্টাল অথবা একটু প্রকৃতি মায়া মোহ আচ্ছন্ন কিছু হলে সেটাকে আমরা রোম্যান্টিক বলি জীবনানন্দ সেই অত রোম্যান্টিক এখন কিন্তু আমরা যখন রোম্যান্টিসিজম বা রোম্যান্টিক ইংরেজি এবং জার্মান দুটো ক্ষেত্রে যখন বলি এর একটা অন্য ইতিহাস আছে এবং এই ইতিহাসটাতে একটা খুব ওই মার্ক্সীয় ধারাতে মার্ক্সীয় যেভাবে আমার মার্কস যেভাবে ভাবতে শিখিয়েছেন আমাদের অনেককে তার মধ্যে যেটা আমরা দেখি যে তার মধ্যে কিন্তু একটা গভীর ইতিহাসের তাড়না আছে যে শিল্প বিপ্লবের থেকে ধনী দরিদ্রের বৈষম্য এবং একটা বিপুল সংখ্যক দরিদ্র মানুষের বাসভূমি হারানো বিশেষ করে 
যেটা আজকে একটা উদ্বাস্তুতা এটা একটা খুব বড় আন্তর্জাতিক প্রায় প্রশ্ন হয়ে দাঁড়িয়েছে সামাজিক সম্পর্ক সামাজিক বিন্যাসের ক্ষেত্রেও একটা খুব বড় ব্যাপার হয়ে দাঁড়িয়েছে সেটার কিন্তু একটা খুব বড় ব্যাপার কিন্তু ঘটে শিল্প বিপ্লবের সময় যখন নতুন কারখানাগুলো উঠছে এবং গ্রামের জমি বেঁচে লোকে চলে আসছে দুপক্ষই যাদের বেশি জমি আছে তারা ওই টাকাটা বেঁচে কারখানাতে লগ্নি করবে শহরে চলে আসছে আর একটু উঁচু স্তরের জীবনযাত্রায় পৌঁছানোর চেষ্টা করছে এবং দরিদ্র মানুষরা তারা জমি ছোট হতে 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 এমন জায়গায় পৌঁছেছে যে তারা আশা করছে যে শহরে গিয়ে যদি আমি কারখানায় কাজ পাই আমি অন্তত সপ্তাহান্তে আমার মজুরি পাবো আমার অনিশ্চয়তা থাকবে না এবং তাদের কাজ দেওয়া যাচ্ছে না যেটা যখন আমরা ঊনবিংশ শতাব্দীর মাঝামাঝি চলে আসছি যেটা ডেকেন্সের সময় তাতে অত্যন্ত প্রকটভাবে বেরিয়ে আসে এবং প্রতিফলিত হচ্ছে এবং মাস্ক সেটা দেখছেন সেখান থেকে ক্যাপিটালের দিকে যাচ্ছে কিন্তু তার আগে এই ব্যাপারটা কিন্তু ইংল্যান্ডের সাহিত্যিকরা ধরেন বা জার্মানিতেও সাহিত্যিকরা ধরতে থাকেন দুভাবে দুদিক থেকে এবং সেইখানে কোথাও একটা অন্য মানবিকতার জায়গা থেকে একটা ভূমিকা আসে রোম্যান্টিসিজমের এবং রোম্যান্টিসিজম কিন্তু সেখানে যেটার সঙ্গে লড়াই করতে যায় সেটা হচ্ছে যুক্তি রিজন রিজন অ্যান্ড সায়েন্স অ্যান্ড ইন্ডাস্ট্রি এই দুটো প্রায় একার্থ সমার্থক হয়ে যায় তার বিরুদ্ধে রোম্যান্টিক্সরা রোম্যান্টিক্সরা মানবিক সম্পর্ক রোম্যান্টিক্সরা প্রকৃতিকে বাঁচিয়ে রাখা এখনকার এনভায়রনমেন্টাল মুভমেন্টের সঙ্গে ওই রোম্যান্টিকদের যুক্ত করা যায় খুব সহজে ওই সময় লাডাইটসরা যারা কারখানায় গিয়ে যন্ত্র ভাঙতে থাকে আপনারা অনেকে হয়তো জানেন যে বাইরন জন্মসূত্রে কারণ উনি ফিউডের পরিবারের সন্তান উনি জন্মে লর্ড হয়ে গেছিলেন লর্ড বাইরন উনি হাউস অফ লর্ডসে একবারই গেছিলেন লাডাইতদের পক্ষ সমর্থন করে বক্তৃতা করার জন্য আর কোনো দিন ঢোকেননি তাতে এবং মার্ক্সের একটা লেখা আছে যাতে উনি বলেন যে যদি বাইরন আরও কিছুদিন বেঁচে থাকতেন তিনি হয়তো আমাদের দিকেই চলে আসতেন কিন্তু সেলি আরও বেশি দিন বেঁচে থাকলে কি হতে জানি না এরকম একটা উক্তি আছে তাই অর্থাৎ এই রাজনৈতিক বোধগুলো বা এইগুলো কিন্তু রোম্যান্টিসিজমের মধ্যে আসতে শুরু করেছে তখন কিন্তু পুরোটা মিলিয়ে যেটা রোম্যান্টিক আন্দোলন তার মধ্যে ব্যতিক্রমে ছিলেন যেমন উইলিয়াম ব্লেক উইলিয়াম ব্লেক একেবারেই বিপ্লবের সঙ্গে যুক্ত হয়েছিলেন আপনারা জানেন বোধ যে টমাস পেন যখন আমেরিকা থেকে পালিয়ে আসেন তখন ব্লেক তাকে একটা ওই ছোট বন্দর বন্দর নয় আর কি সেখানে কোনো রকম একটা ছোট জাহাজে করে পালিয়ে আসেন সেখান থেকে বন্ধ সেই ঘাট থেকে বলা যায় সেখান থেকে ব্লেক ওকে ওর বাড়িতে নিয়ে আসেন তাই এই যোগাযোগগুলো হচ্ছে উইলিয়াম মরিস মার্কস পড়েছে আর একটু পরে এবং বার্নেট শয়ের মার্কস বাদে প্রথম পাঠ উইলিয়াম মরিসের কাছে উইলিয়াম মরিসের বাড়িতে মরিসের মেয়ে মেয়ে মরিসের সঙ্গে তখন শয়ের প্রেম এবং ওখানে গেলেই মার্কস তখন যা মার্কসের মার্কসের জনুবাদ হয়েছে তার থেকে মরিসকে পড়ে শোনান এবং ব্যাখ্যা করেন তো এইগুলো কিন্তু আস্তে আস্তে ঘটছে অর্থাৎ রোম্যান্টিক আন্দোলন ইংল্যান্ডের রোম্যান্টিক আন্দোলনের সঙ্গে সমাজতান্ত্রিক চিন্তাধারা চিন্তা ভাবনার অনেকগুলো যোগাযোগ কিন্তু তখন তৈরি হয়েছে ব্লেকের কবিতায় অসাধারণভাবে এগুলো এসেছে এবং খ্রিস্ট ধর্মের অপপ্রয়োগ অপব্যবহার সেটাকে বারবার আক্রমণ করছেন একটা বিশ্বাসের জায়গা থেকেও এইগুলো কিন্তু ঘটছে তখন তার ফলে রোম্যান্টিসিজমের ইংল্যান্ডের রোম্যান্টিসিজমের একটা খুব জোরালো একটা বৈপ্লবিক বা সমাজতান্ত্রিক একটা ঝোঁক বা প্রবণতা ছিল এবং সেটা মার্কস উপলব্ধিও করেছে উক্তি আছে সেটা এই যে মানে একজন কবি সেই কারণে কবিতা লেখে যে কারণে একটা মাকর্ষা জাল বনে 
অর্থাৎ এটা সামথিং অর্গ্যানিক মানে এটা ওই শ্রেণী দ্বারা নিয়ন্ত্রিত নয় যেটা আমরা ওই মানে অনেক সময় এই ভুলটা তো করে বসি একটা কবির বা একটা শিল্প সাহিত্য বিচার করতে গিয়ে ওই ওই ক্লাস এলিমেন্টটা দিয়েই তাকে বিচার করছি মার্কস নিজে কিন্তু বলছেন ওই ওটা ওই মাকড়সার জাল বোনার মতন ব্যাপার একজন কবি এই মানে হি আর শি ক্যানট হেল্প রাইটিং পয়েন্ট এই যে জায়গাটা অর্থাৎ আমাকে ওইখান থেকে দেখতে হবে তার সৃজনশীলতাকে তার ক্লাস এলিমেন্টটা দিয়ে নয় না আমি আমার আলোচনা সেই জন্য না না আপনি এটা বলেন আমি বলছি এই এই ভুলটা আমরা তো ভীষণ করা ক্রমাগত করে চলেছি এখনও হয়তো করছি ওই যে রবীন্দ্রনাথকে নিয়ে যে রবীন্দ্রনাথ বসুয়া ছিলেন অতএব অতএব হয়ে গেল ওকে খারিজ করে দেওয়া যায় কিন্তু এবং বারবার যেটা যে কথাটা মার্কস বলছেন যে একটা লিভিং প্রসেসের মধ্যে দিয়ে সে ইভলভ করছে এবং সে বাঁচছে এবং সেই সবগুলির সঙ্গে কিন্তু ডিল করছে নেগোসিয়েট করছে সেইখান থেকে একটা কালচারাল প্রোডাক্ট আসছে এবং সেটা রবীন্দ্রনাথের ক্ষেত্রে এমনভাবে মানে রাজনৈতিক টালমাটালটাকে এতভাবে এতভাবে উনি নিচ্ছেন ভাঙছেন তার মধ্যে দিয়ে নিজে আবদ পাল্টাচ্ছেন আমি একটা জাস্ট মানে জিনিস জিজ্ঞেস করছি যেটা উনি বললেন যে আমার মানে এটা একটা ক্লারিফিকেশন যেটা আমার মনে হয় যে যিনি যখন একজন কেউ লিখছেন মানে লেখা বা আঁকা বা ফিল্ম হোয়াট এভার দ্য ক্রিয়েটার সেই অর্থে তিনি কি তার যে এনভায়রনমেন্টে তিনি তৈরি হচ্ছে যেটা তুমি যেটা যেটা বলছো যে কালচারাল যে তার যে একটা কালচারাল সোশ্যাল ইকোনমিক সেইটার কি রিফ্লেকশন তার আর্টেতে পড়ছে না মানে ক্যান হি ওভারকাম হিজ এনভায়রনমেন্ট কমপ্লিটলি and be a creator in his environment or shikar karar ba na kara kotha hocche na kintu eta jeta ami mars theke jeta quote korchhilam je eta kintu reflex hisebe ashbe ebong je muhurte ekjon lekhok tar ba artist tar medium ta ke byabohar korbe tar medium ta kintu she community theke nichche she medium ta kintu toiri kora ei muhurte ami medium ta toiri korchhen na dekhi and the medium has its store of things বাংলায় একজন একটা লেখক লেখক কিছু লিখতে গিয়ে যে একটা শব্দ ব্যবহার করছেন সেই শব্দটার কিন্তু একটা ইতিহাস আছে এবং সেই ইতিহাসের পুরো ভারটাকে নিয়ে কিন্তু শব্দটা চলে আসবে এই লেখক চান কি না চান অনেক সময় লেখক চেষ্টা করেন যে অন্য বারবারই যেটা আমরা অনেক সময় বিষ্ণুবাবুর কবিতায় বা সুন্দরবাবুর কবিতায় দেখেছি যে ইচ্ছে করে তারা কারণ উনি জানেন যে এই শব্দটা যেই ব্যবহার করব তার সঙ্গে ওই শব্দটাকে ঘিরে একটা আবহ তৈরি হয়ে যাবে এটা প্রায় বলয় তৈরি হয়ে যায় অর্থের আমি সেটা চাই না আমি এটাকে অন্য অর্থে এটাকে চিহ্নিত করতে চাই ভেঙে বের করে আনতে চাই তার ফলে প্রায় এমন একটা শব্দ ওখানে ফেলেন যেটা ওখানে প্রত্যাশিত নয় তার ফলে অপ্রত্যাশিত শব্দটা এসে ওই শব্দটা যেটা আদি আবহ ওটাকে ভেঙে দিল ভেঙে দিয়ে ওটাকে একটা নতুন সপ্তাহ এনে ফেলল তাই বারবার আমরা যে অনেক সময় পাই যে এই দুটো শব্দ একসঙ্গে আসে না একটা ধাক্কা দেয় আমাদের ধাক্কাটা কিন্তু ইচ্ছে করে দেওয়া টু রিট্রিভ দ্যাট ওয়ার্ড ফ্রম ইটস কন্টিনিউম তো এই রকম অনেকগুলো কাজ তাই অনবরত যখন কেউ লিখছেন বা যখন কেউ ছবি আঁকছেন যখন একটা একজন শিল্পী একটা স্ট্রোকও দিচ্ছেন সেই স্ট্রোকটা খুব জোরালো কারো স্ট্রোক আছে সেটা হয়তো কালীঘাটের পটে স্ট্রোক কে দিকে চলে যায় তখন তাকে ওটাকে আটকাতে হয় so he is also responding and reacting to the language and the language is given by the community it's a formation of the community the a interaction that it upor marx bar bar jor dan ebong amader marx er pore chobi dekhte giye ba nach dekhte giye ba theater dekhte giye ba lekha dekhte giye e je eto rokom layers should be layers na more than the layer the conflicts e je ta bolche je ekta word ke ami bhangchi কারণ ওই ওয়ার্ডটাকে আমি রিট্রিভ করতে চাই এই যে টেনশনসগুলো তৈরি হয় উইচ ইজ আ ফ্যাসিনেটিং রিডিং অ্যান্ড রেসপন্ডিং টু কালচার এই জায়গাটা মার্কস কিন্তু না দিলে আর কেউ কিন্তু এইভাবে দেননি আমাদের আমি আর একটা জাস্ট জিনিস জিজ্ঞেস করতে চাই সেটা হচ্ছে যে ইউ টক অফ রেজিস্টেন্স ট্রান্সফরমেশন রেজিস্টেন্স ওয়েন দ্য রুলিং ক্লাস ইজ ম্যানিপুলেটিং their ideas on the people shei shomoy theke the resistance ta o toiri hoy so ei je eta eta je ei je correlation ta 
it a maniki is it a reaction to that imposition of the ideas of the ruling class history hum je kono change kintu ei conflict er moddhe diye ashbe जानिक देखिए कथा ओरिजिनल मानेटाशन थे थ्रु लिमिनेशन भेतर बहरे बैरिए आसा एवं जे भाव उन्नी प्रसेसटा के बार बार देखा जगूर एक इंटरक्टिविटी चले हि इज नट एप्रोचिंग दिस फ्रम द सैकोलजिकल एंड तरह हि इज अवेयर अब द माइंड कारण माइंड ना थकले इंटरक्शनगुल क्रिएटिविटी की कर हाँ निश्चय एवं मार्क्स प्रचुर मार्क्स वज एवं भेरि पैशनेट रिडर अब लिटरेचर तक उन्नी से लिटरेचर टेक्सगुलो की उन्नी जो लिखन सेगुलो नहीं ब्रिलियंट इनसाइट मास्टरफुल इनसाइट हिंदू पत्रिकारे आनंद बजार टेलीग्राफेटमैन पत्रिकार स्टेट संक्रांत दृष्टिभंग मध्य एज ए रिडर मन हो पर्याप्त पार्थक्य आज हाउ डू एक्सप्लेन दिस दिस नम्बर वन एंड सेकेंडलि गतकाले जो सेमिनार कथा अपनी बलें पार्थ चट्टोपाध्याय मुन्न कथा खूब साधारण पाठक तो दोटो बांगला संवादपत्र रेगुलर पढ़ी गत पाँच बचरे देखे नाइनटी फाइव पार्सेंट बुक रिव्यू बांगला बी से ठीक उल्टो मन है बांगला बर लेखक और बांगला बे लेखन शक्ति कौ एक दुर्भिक्ष देखा दिए से ही बीगुल उपयुक्त भावे रिव्यू कर पाठक पहुँचे देवर प्रयोजनता बोध है समालोचक पाचन ना हमें जानते ही अपन का अच्छा अपन द्वित अंशार उत्तर दी जेहेतु बांगला बर प्रकाशक निजे और अन्न अनेक प्रकाशक बी सम्पादना कर तात्पर्यपूर्ण बी गत दस बारो बचर अनेक पे जेगुलो क्यों बड़ पत्रिकाय समालोचना है खूब गुरुत्वपूर्ण क्ज अनेक दिक्कत तरह गुरुत्व आगू क्यों है ना जानी ना 
এবং তখন ওই সন্দেহটা আমাদের দেখা দেয় যে যেমন ধরুন একজন আমি বলতে পারি আমাদের সমাজ বিজ্ঞানী একজন বন্ধু তিনি দীর্ঘদিন মহারাষ্ট্রে আনঅর্গানাইজ লেবারের সঙ্গে কাজ করেছেন তাদের নিয়ে তার কাজ স্বপ্না বন্দ্যোপাধ্যায় গুহ তিনি প্রথম মারাঠি থেকে দলিত কবিতা অনুবাদ করলেন বাংলায় সরাসরি কারণ তিনি ওদের নিয়ে কাজ করেছেন মারাঠিটা খুব ভালো জানেন অনেক দিন ধরে থেকেছেন এবং তাদের অনেককে উনি ব্যক্তিগতভাবে চেনেন তাদের ব্যক্তিগত পরিচয় দিয়ে উনি এই বইটা করেছেন এই বইয়ের কোথাও কোনো সমালোচনা বেরোয়নি অর্থাৎ এইটে সমালোচনার অযোগ্য এটা কি করে আমি বলবো আমি জানি না একটা উদাহরণ দিলাম এবং অনেক বই নিয়ে কাজ করি আরও অনেক বই যেগুলো নিয়ে আমি কাজ করি না সেগুলো পড়ি তাই ওইটাতে আমি কিছুতেই একমত হতে পারবো না যে আনন্দবাজার বা এই সময়ের সম্পাদকেরা তাদের বিপুল বুদ্ধি এবং জ্ঞানের ভারে স্থির করেছেন যেগুলো সমালোচনার অযোগ্য সেই জন্য সমালোচনা করছেন না এইটা আমি মানব না আচ্ছা আরেকটা হচ্ছে যে আমি যখন বলি যে ক্যাপিটাল মিডিয়া এবং স্টেট এতে বিভিন্ন সময় বিভিন্ন রকম অ্যালাইনমেন্ট এবং মিডিয়ার মিডিয়া আমি জেনারেলাইজ যখন করছি আপনিও কিন্তু দুটো এক্সেপশনের কথা বললেন যে ফ্রান্ট লাইন আর হিন্দু তাই তো বললেন না আচ্ছা এই দুটো কিন্তু যদি হ্যাঁ হয়তো অন্য কাগজগুলো চেয়ে এটা লেবারেল এবং সেটার মধ্যেও যদি কেউ ভালো করে এটা নিয়ে কাজ করেন তাহলে এটার সাপোর্ট সিস্টেমটা এবং সাদার্ন চেম্বার অফ কমার্সের সঙ্গে আমাদের এখানকার চেম্বার অফ কমার্সের এর কন্ট্রাডিকশনসগুলোও কিন্তু এখানে খেলা করে ভীষণ রকম কাজ করে তার ফলে ওরা যে ইস্যুসগুলোকে ওরা প্রশ্রয় দেবেন রিপোর্ট করবেন এখানে সেগুলো করা হবে না কারণ আদার বিজনেস ইন্টারেস্ট আর ইন প্লে তো এগুলো কিন্তু একেবারে ওই লেভেলে যে এক্সেপশনগুলো হয় সেগুলো হয়তো দেখা যাবে যে সার্টেন থিং সার্টেন থিং যেগুলো এখানে খুব রেলেভেন্ট স্টেটের আটকানো দরকার বা মিডিয়ারও আটকানো দরকার ট্রেড ও চায়না সেটা সেখানে হবে ওখানে আরেকভাবে হচ্ছে তাই ওখানেও কিন্তু একটা সাপ্রেশন অফ নিউজ হিন্দুতেও চলে এবং হিন্দুতে আমাদেরও অনেক সাংবাদিক বন্ধু আছে তাদেরও অনেকবার এক্সপিরিয়েন্স হয়েছে যে অনেক খবর যেটা ওখানে খুব রেলেভেন্ট ওরা দিতে যাচ্ছেন সেই খবর কিন্তু চেপে দেওয়া হয়েছে সেটা কিন্তু হিন্দুতেও ঘটে ফ্রান্ট লাইনেও ঘটে কিন্তু আমরা এখান থেকে সেটা ধরতে পারবো না কারণ ওটা ওখানকার লোকাল পলিটিক্সের প্রিন্সিপালস হচ্ছে তো এইগুলো ভেবে রাখা দরকার সেইটা অস্বীকার করে